Hi, this is Rick Hansen with Amazing Greats, the podcast. How you doing today? Glad you're here with us. We have an exciting story to tell today. A gentleman, a broadcast buddy of mine who started in just regular old Top 40 radios back in the 70s and was a huge success in Top 40 radio, but it all came to a screeching halt when he had an idea. We're going to find out about that idea, his life story, all here on Amazing Greats. He was the founder of the, the greatest contemporary Christian radio station network in the world. Here's the story of Bob Anthony. On Zoom with my friend Bob Anthony in Spokane, Washington, live and direct. Good morning, Bob, and thanks for taking some time with us. Hey there, Rick. Yeah, yeah. So in the radio business, a move from Spokane to the number two radio station in the country KHJ in Los Angeles was a humongous leap in the radio business. And here you are at a little medium-sized market, maybe even small market, going to the number two market. Walk us through how that happened, Bob. I had written down as my goal in radio when I was 19 and hadn't even done my first air shift. I wrote down, my goal in radio is to work at 93 KHJ in Los Angeles. Boss radio, that's what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... So that was tough. That was a tough decision. Um, the PD flew us down first class, you know, met us at Universal Studios and, you know, and, it, you know, wined and dined us and there. Well, how could I say no? Yeah. You know, so I was offered a job to, you know, working now, now with Charlie Tuna, Machine Gun Kelly, Bobby Ocean, all these legend, other legendary radio names. How could I say no? KHJ and Bob Anthony. Sure, I'll play a song for you. I mean, if I can't play a song for you now, when can I? 520-1978. Call me. I'll do it for you. KHJ, Bob Anthony, Flying Economy. I'm always in the coach section, you know. Steve Miller, Band in the Jet Airliner, 612. Was- you want to hand me the uh, the deep stick there? I want to see how deep your love is. BGs on KHJ. All right. And then right. you went to KFRC. So yeah. I think we're, you know, we got to, we got to move this along because you had such an amazing career back then. So this was like, um, the, 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 the concept here is you really moved quickly along the fast track of radio in the seventies, which is, which is fantastic. So now you're at KFRC, but then the shocking news is that Bob Anthony's leaving KFRC in San Francisco, another legendary radio station, and you're going to start this new thing um, that it, it started on a yellow pad somewhere. So tell us that story. Well, uh, the 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 real story there, Rick, is that uh, I made a m- momentous lifetime decision. Yeah. Because th- this is this is where, you know, you have to say, well, th- something happened that that made you leave a three hour a day job sitting down, no jackhammers, <laughs> no pickaxes, <laughs> no canary in a coal mine. This was a good job. I had a nice gig following Dr. Don Rose, you know, and it'd be fun driving over the Golden Gate Bridge listening, Dr. Don Rose uh, coming up at nine o'clock, Bob Anthony, and he'd make some joke about me. And I'm thinking this, this doesn't get any better than I'm in heaven. I'm in radio heaven. I'm in radio heaven. Exactly. Well, but the, the thing for me was, yes, I had gained for me, I, I gained the world. Okay, I had my my list that I had made as a younger foolish man. I had my cool cars. They were cool cars and a lot of fun stuff. We could talk about cars. And I had the house with the pool. I had the job that I've always wanted. I had all those things. But I also had a verse from my childhood. I was raised in a Christian home. And I always believe Jesus is exactly who he said he was, the son of God. And and he died on the cross for our sins. And and he he died and rose again. And he's coming back. I believe all of those things. I didn't ever have a problem with that. Some people don't believe. I believe. But but I also was not living 100% for God. 
And there was a verse that said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Well, I, I gained, you know, I wasn't Jeff Bezos. He wasn't even around. <laughs> he wasn't born yet. There was no Amazon yet. <laughs> but I knew that I wasn't right with God. And so I had to make the decision. Am I really ready? Jesus said, count the cost. I counted the cost. Well, what, what would happen to my life? What would God do if I really said, I'm totally 1,000% committed? You can do anything. You can ask me to sell everything. You can ask me to do whatever. If you want me going to San Francisco International Airport and handing out flowers and saying, Jesus loves you and begging for quarters, because <laughs> that's what I You're saw. In. <laughs> there it is. There, I'll do that. Coming into KFRC, I would see the, the people on Market Street with Bibles yelling at people yeah. to repent. I'm going, God, is that what I have to do? <laughs> uh, you know? Um, but that wasn't God's, that, that wasn't where God had you. That uh, wasn't God's plan for me. No. It was a plan for that other guy <laughs> with the, with the, with the baggy jeans. So, I gave my life a hundred percent. I got, I, I did the, the posture of submission. I got on my knees and just said, God, whatever you want. Well, I'll that is amazing. That, that is amazing. Well. I'd love well, that. Well, well, it is. Jesus said, count the cost. I, I didn't do it immediately. Uh, it took me two weeks of two, really. <laughs> two weeks is to, pretty much. Well, pretty. okay. Well, <laughs> fine. Yeah. Two weeks. But I thought, well, what if I would have got hit by a big blue truck? While I'm still thinking, you know, God says, you didn't, you didn't make the decision in time, but that's not God. So, no. so, so I, then this on a yellow pad, I love the story about the yellow pad because I use them all the time and yeah. I know you do too. And that's where plans are made. Well, because we have an office supply fetish. That's I do. The, 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 I mean, that. I like to hang out in the. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, in Staples. In the envelope <laughs> aisle. Is that it's Rick just... again in Staples? Oh yeah. So so so, so on your pad, what it, you had a, a game plan for this new idea, right? Well, I, the idea didn't come after I got up off my knees. It came about six months later. I'm living in Sausalito, and just sitting at my desk with a blank yellow pad, and the thought came to me, what would a Christian KFRC sound like? Well, with that level of professionalism, because that was a big impactful thing in my life was KFRC. Yeah. It won Radio Station of the Year Award five years in a row. So KFRC was a, a lot of people have grown up with the top 40 radio station in their past. It's fast paced. It's hot uh, rotation of music. You hear all your favorite songs over and over again over a period of a day. And they were the hits. So you yeah. got the hits. You got this fast paced uh, radio station with DJs. You got jingles. You know, those things that sing the, yeah, the, yeah, the call letters. Yeah. All that stuff at KFRC. How did that translate then in your mind and on your yellow pad to what? K-Love began to be, right? Well, uh, it, it was uh, a moment of clarity for me about, well, we want a station that would be like KFRC and unlike what Christian radio pretty much was at the time, which was pre uh, pay-to-play pl pay preaching, teaching, uh, and music was a filler. It wasn't like the format ingredient the way most radio stations are, secular stations. So so it would this, be... This year, like year was about what time? What, what time period are we talking <clears throat> about here? Was this 1980s by then, now? So no, the, so this is 1978. So okay. uh, I gave my life 100% to the Lord probably in the spring of 78. And by the fall of 78... Uh, Literally, I'm sitting at my desk and writing a Christian KFRC with a question mark. And, mm -hmm. and I know what that meant to me. I mean, these were just my notes for myself. Uh, uh, but but top level of professionalism, top to bottom, a good signal, uh, 
And one of the things I, I wrote down on the yellow pad was no Christianese. It was talk, talk normal, talk the way people talk. Don't start sounding like you're from another planet. So at that time, there was really not even a category of contemporary Christian music that it, like it is today. There were some songs and there was kind of a, 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 a blossoming new idea. But was that a struggle to find music enough that was you considered non-Christianese-ish a pop top 40 music in Christian world? Contemporary Christian music, it was out there and it had been out there and growing since the early 70s. And in fact, here in Spokane, uh, probably a, right around the late 60s, early 70s, remember Wilson McKinley? Do you remember that group? Well, they were very, you, you probably had already left by that time to head to the big time, Rick. But <laughs> uh, Wilson McKinley was probably the top, one of the top bands in Spokane. Well, they all got, got saved. And they were at the I Am Coffee House doing uh, Christian music. This is like late 60s, 1970 or so. So there was Chris, contemporary Christian music where, where rock and roll groups were starting to do it. Chuck Gerard, he was with the Hondells. He was doing it out of Calvary Chapel, the, the, the group Love Song. Second chapter of Acts, Keith Green, uh, on and on, Phil Keggy. There were quite a number, John Fisher, Pam Mark Hall. They were all, a lot of them were Southern California or Northern California at the time. But as I dug into it, I saw, well, we may just be able to squeak by. One of the amazing things about early contemporary Christian radio is that it, it radio drove the Christian music scene. Oh, uh, Absolutely. It, very it, much. Now there was a now there was a, a place where mm -hmm. it was going to be played on a regular basis in a great professional atmosphere and people and it was going to have an audience. And so right. now you have these people flooding. Well, I don't know if it's flooding, but at least attracted to the idea of creating great Christian music in a, in, a, right. in a rocky format. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's exactly what happened. And one of the first things I did was contact. I did, did the research to find well. Are, who are these Christian record companies? Well, it was Sparrow and Word, and I got a hold of them, and uh, they graciously allowed this uh, the, this person in San Francisco claiming to have an idea for a Christian <laughs> radio station. Uh, they actually put me on their list to receive all this product, which in hindsight is like, well, I mean, that, that's another God thing because I wouldn't have believed me. <laughs> yeah, this you is know, this come you from. know. So yeah. you bought so then uh to fast forward, so the idea was was planted and it started maturing and then it went on the air in Santa Rosa, correct? Right. 1982. And that was you you purchased this radio station in, in Santa Rosa. Yeah, it was a uh a, a, a out of a bankruptcy situation. Uh we had been working uh, for about three years up to that point uh, to somehow get a radio station or convince some other station to change their format and let us do it or whatever. We, we had, we tried everything. Um, and uh, we wanted a hundred thousand watt station in San Francisco. It's what we wanted. What we got was, it, but the, they were, several million dollars to buy yeah. that but we we were full of faith and we thought well you know god can do anything so we're just going to put it all out there well we didn't get the hundred thousand watts in san francisco we got 450 watts in, <laughs> in santa, santa rosa, rosa. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of a building about two feet off the ground the antenna so didn't go very far so. yeah but as the saying goes, you were blooming where you were planted, and right. that's exactly. where it all started. Yeah. So yeah. you put the format on the air, mm -hmm. and did you see like immediate success, or did it take a while to kind of um, get an audience together? Well, we actually started pretty quickly uh, because uh, when we got the station in in eighty one, it took us about a year to get on the air. Uh, because the the 
competing applicant, the competing person at the bankruptcy who was bidding on the station there with us was the owner of the tower that our equipment was on. Oh. And as he walked out of the courtroom, he said, well, you won the station, but you lose. Get off my tower. Oh my gosh! So your first, we, uh, your first challenge. No, the now. first challenge. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> here's this antenna <laughs> and coax and transmitter and all that. So we relocated all of the, the literally relocated the transmitter from inside a transmitter building, which you can picture that, and it, yeah. right there into the production room of the radio station. So made production kind of difficult sometimes see, with yeah. that fan blowing but um so and it took us a year so during that year we created a volunteer team that was doing promotion we were doing concerts we were uh, talking to churches we were doing all these things we were training board operators on how to run the board we were gathering the music we were creating the hot clocks. We were doing. We were building this radio station from the ground up, with the idea that as soon as we could get the approval from the FCC, which came about a year later, and with all the engineering that had to be done, moving everything, well, we actually hit the ground pretty strong. We hit hmm. the ground running in Santa Rosa. And when the and when the format went on the air, uh, what were the elements that you were able to re? construct from your kfrc um knowledge and awareness uh what were those what were those elements i mean we're talking did, did you do news did you do jingles did you have uh did you have those kind of uh, cool djs that were in between the songs and all that no none of that i did no <laughs> none of that no, no those are no, those are expensive rick uh, <laughs> so it it took a while i did the morning show though i mean so so I like to think, well, at least we started the day, you know, it, <laughs> sounding like in, KFRC. A, in a fairly yeah. professional manner. I was, you know, but uh, I had the radio friends of mine who not all of them were believers at the time. But I mean, I had all of my KFRC friends. So so Mike Novak, uh, Big Tom Parker, Bobby Ocean. All, all these guys, Jack Friday, all these folks contributed production elements and sweepers and um, and voicers. So to to the average listener who tuned in, they're hearing San Francisco world, you know, major market disc jockeys doing things. Yeah, And really, it's a little bit smoke and mirrors. And we started having basically voice track shows. And that was, we were, we had to be, I don't know, I'm sure there were other people who were doing voice track shows in the early 80s. But we, we had to be among the pioneers because, you know, we, we wanted it to sound, to have that major market level, you know, tight and bright and professional um, but we didn't have money to hire disc jockeys and things, and we didn't want to have volunteers who really weren't at that level doing things either. So, how did uh, how did the the term K Love come into existence? Well, you can't call it KCLB. Uh, let Let's have something else uh, that's more befitting that would fit all across the country. And uh, Dick Jenkins and Burkhart did some research and and felt that uh, K Love was the best that they yeah. could figure out. Positive encouraging K Love. So K Love could drop in any market anywhere in this right. kind of network scenario. Well, well, almost any market because there was in a Los somewhere. Angeles there's a big Spanish station. That was K Lave, and that's oh, K Lave, ah. and uh, so that had to be worked out, and and it was, and I think there was another station, I don't know, Dallas or something else that was also K Lave, but that had to be worked out as well. But you know, 
So, uh, so the so the network idea was off and running with Dick Jenkins and yes. others, as yeah. well as, and you're still actively involved in in. The I'm, at that point, program. I was a consultant, oh, and okay. I was up in and uh, and had moved to Portland, and started Spirit FM, another contemporary Christian music station in Portland at 107.5 FM. With the same concept, the the same KFRC thing. format brought to Christian radio. Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. And uh, and we actually did have uh, more live disc jockeys on the air, and Brian O'Neill was on there for some time, and another friend of mine, Ron Erickson, was on, and I did a I did a, a show as well. But there was a lot of voice tracking, and uh, yeah. Joe Michaels. Our friend Joe yeah. was on Spirit FM, and and Ed Daly, and a number of Larry Wayne, and so, uh, so is that the so at that point you'd stepped away from the other than consulting. You weren't working right. day to day basis with what was then uh, becoming built as K Love, right? Uh, and so so what was <clears throat> at that point? What was K Love's um, upward projection are they, were they adding stations constantly yes. or? if you go to uh the i think it's called the klovestory.com you see a map that with a timeline and the map is showing the the klov signals that start appearing around the country i, I still my jaw drops when yeah. i see it because you know this is this is uh this is a God thing. Well, now there is uh, in the neighborhood, I, I think the figure that I saw last was there's over 500 uh, K-Love radio signals across the country. Uh, they reach like 7 million people a week at this point. So this little idea of a guy who gave his life to Jesus and said, use me as you as you see fit, has grown into this just huge amazing network, the largest in the world, a uh, network of Christian uh, radio stations, Christian music radio stations. So now you sit back, uh, here you are in Spokane and, and stepped away. I guess I want to, before we, before we get to that, I want to know what was the circumstances by which you stepped away from uh, the K-Love organization altogether? Was it um, just- Well, let's see, that was or? about 2002. So I'd been doing it for 22 20 some years at that point, I saw that there was a need for us to, from an evangelistic standpoint, to fish on the other side of the boat, so to speak. And, uh, you know, the, the nets were being cast on one side of the boat, I felt. And, uh, you know, there was there's certainly a harvest there, but there was a whole nother group of people that needed to be reached that weren't listening to Caleb. Uh, they're they're listening to all the other radio stations. So uh, in the 90s, uh, I started a ministry called Gospel Spots, where we would put evangelistic 30 second radio and TV spots on secular mainstream radio and TV stations. And so one of the things we did in the late 90s is put a, a commercial literally during the Super Bowl. Paul McCartney's halftime appearance on the Super Bowl, we put a 30-second evangelistic, very bold gospel message hmm. right there. And so that's what Gospel Spots was all about. We did that for uh, 10 years after uh, the K-Love thing. I gotcha. Okay. Looking back now, and you're kind of you're kind of the the uh the the godfather of uh of K Love, I mean, you're the guy that had the original idea and put the original idea to play. Um, I, I just want to know how you feel about that. Well, I, I, I'm almost at a loss for words because, really, I mean, God could have chosen anybody He wanted to, uh, and you know, there are those who say, "Well." If you say no, he's going to go on to the next person. <laughs> and I, I don't know if that's how theologically how it works. I, I don't know. God knows. But uh, I just, it was a simple matter of obedience in for me to do what I felt God called me to do. I didn't 
and I still don't audibly hear God's voice. I know people who say they do, and I believe them, um, but I think if I heard God's voice, it would probably scare me to death, first <laughs> off, if, you know, Bob. Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. what a great radio voice he must have. It seemed good to me to use the talents that God gave me in radio and in in and and I have a gift for teaching as well uh and f- just for talking <laughs> to to do something that that used those gifts and so it didn't seem like God wanted me to go to San Francisco International Airport right yeah yeah, yeah. I was ready to do that and I and and I I I really was hoping that he wasn't calling me to screech at people on Market Street. Yeah. But I was ready if that's what he wanted in any event. So uh, at a certain point uh, with the yellow pad and we're and now we started Christian Media Ministries in order to 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 accomplish this vision. And people were coming on board, Uh, people who are high level. Uh, people in the business community and the Christian ministry community were joining uh, with us. Uh, Dave Lobby, he was a top level executive with Hewlett Packard and U.S. West, one of the top, like whatever, 12 vice presidents that they had. So he was on our board right from the start. And uh, David Gilmore, who was with Youth for Christ, he joined to help us in the fundraising side. So, I mean, you know, God had all these other people in it. So it wasn't just me. And it was all God doing it anyway. So yeah. he gets the glory. No human being getting the glory. We just were obedient to do it. All I want to do at this point, for me personally, yeah, my yellow pad, I've got them here. I could, I could dig them out. And you'd say, gosh, you really have it bad. <laughs> You got with this yellow, yellow pad pad <laughs> yeah but uh th- there are things that i want to do with whatever time god allows me to have i want to finish strong i want to uh endure to the end serving god and so um i've reserved biblequestionman.com as a a, a new ministry uh, that I'm going to be doing here in the coming months, and it's going to be, it's going to be kind of fun because uh, I'm going to dig into those, que- those, those fun questions, the theological questions that people have. Uh, they want to. Everybody has. There's so many opinions out there. Okay, so that so that's that's the next chapter of Bob Anthony. Next now chapter. Let's, just, let's jump back because I we really haven't touched on the personal <clears throat> testimony of you as a human being. Uh, you started this journey with Jesus uh, as a at a very young age as a Catholic a student mm-hmm. in a Catholic yeah. school district or Catholic schools. Um, tell us about that journey and and did the and how it maybe went from learning about Jesus to a relationship with Jesus well uh this is again where i i never didn't believe but i also had started observing over my life that there were a lot of opinions out there they're just, uh, just everybody. Well, how are you saved? Well, it depends who you ask. Yeah. Well, you no, know, there's a biblical way to be saved. Oh, yeah, yes, that's yes, I I agree, but it depends who you ask again, because there are those, and we won't name names, but it's it's uh, one side said the other side is apostate and heretics and vice versa, and it's like, well, somebody's right. And so before I totally surrendered, I wanted to know, well, who can I trust? What's the one voice where, that, that, that shows the way uh, uh, to eternal life? What's the truth? Well, you know, there is one person who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that's Jesus. So I thought, well, I'm going to study Jesus' words, and I would go through the Gospels, and read the gospel, what Jesus said. And you know what? 
a lot of it was different than the things I was hearing other people say. Hmm. So, and I'll just throw this out just as a challenge. Um, you want to readjust your theology. Just commit to reading like the Gospel of Matthew over and over. Read it 30 times. Get back to me. I mean, things will change. And one of the most impactful short things that happened in my life was I met Dr. Char, uh, Dr. Charles Feinberg. Now, you say, who's that? I know Billy Graham. I know Dr. Dobson. Who is Charles Feinberg? Well, I didn't know who he was either, but he came to our church one time. And as the introduction to him getting up to speak was, uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Feinberg, uh, is going to speak here, and he reads through the entire Bible four times a year. I mean, do the math. How 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 much time does this guy spend? Yeah, reading yeah. the Bible. Wow. Uh, and so here he is at our church, and I didn't know he was famous. I didn't know till later in life who this person was. I invited him to my house. <laughs> Hey, hey, Chuck, you want to come <laughs> over to the house and talk for a while? Anyway, he came. He came to our house, and and I, and I came away. It's like, wow. You, you, first off, it's physically possible to read through the Bible four times in a year. Yes, yeah. it is. Uh, but I committed to reading through the Bible. Well, let me see if I can do it like once a year. Uh, and doing that, we'll do that. Go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, every year, and do it for 40 years and see if your theology doesn't change a bit. Mm -hmm. And it's and it really is about God's Word, and so that's what's been impactful in my life. It was a realization that, as Jesus said, count the cost, the, the, the rich young ruler came and asked, how do I gain eternal life? You know the commandments, do them, and you will live. Well, as a part of being a Catholic, I actually knew the commandments, you know, one through 10. I'm the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make worship or serve an idol, you know, don't take God's name in vain, and and go from there, and and check them off, and just is that what you're doing? Well, the first commandment is is really the key. Is God number one in my life? And that's where Jesus says, count the cost, count the cost. So that was the aha moment is, okay, now I know what I really have to do, but am I willing to do it? That's the question. And, and not everyone is ready to do it. So I was... That's when I got on my knees and said, whatever you want, uh, you got. Well, have there been times, are there times that you can identify that you, uh, an, a prayer went unanswered, uh, a prayer that you thought was um, something God would address and would acknowledge and fulfill, but didn't? How do you deal with that? Well, you know, I God's ways are are higher than our ways and my wisdom is foolishness to God. And so I pray for healing for people that I know that are, are sick and have cancer and are terminal. And I'm praying that God would, you know, do a miraculous healing. And, and some, some are, some aren't, mm -hmm. but God hears all of our prayers and whether we get, a, a verbal answer or a, a check in the mail, <laughs> that's up to God. So, but he, okay. he does hear all of our prayers. What about, um, and I ask this of everybody, and if you don't have one off the top of your head, that's okay. <clears> too. But is there, a, a, there's, you've read the Bible multiple times. Uh, is there a verse that uh, you say, this is, this is my life verse. This is in a nutshell, a verse that is, vital to my to me and and my everyday life well there's a a, a verse that, that you know, one of the things paul said 
in uh, Romans, uh, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. And, you know, uh, that's a great statement. Of course, that's a big word, that word belief, because it isn't just acknowledging that, that Jesus existed because the, the demons know that and they shudder. And they know that Jesus is the Son of God. They know that he died on the cross. They know all the things that are the basis of Christian theology. Demons know those things. Well, what's the difference? Well, that there, it's all, what does that mean to believe in the Lord Jesus? But whoever does won't be disappointed. But my operating verse also is, uh, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? So I'm always conscious of, yeah, what am I, what, where are my priorities for the day? Where are my priorities in life? Because they should be on godly things and have an eternal perspective of where, where we're going and, and what kind of fruit are we, are we developing here? Are we bringing in fruit for the kingdom? God bless you, my friend. Thanks so much thank for you, the Rick. time. Oh, thank you, Rick. My pleasure. Wow, what a great story. Uh, Top 40 DJ becomes a radio station format founder, and then he goes on to, um, to do all kinds of great things to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you heard, he's not done yet. So stay tuned. You'll find out more about what he's up to here on Amazing Greats. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you hit like, that'd be great. If you hit like uh, subscribe, that'd be even better. If you share it, that's good. All of that to help us build our audience here at Amazing Greats. Thanks so much. God bless.